be a Bible character? Would you rather be Jeremiah or Hosea? Ignore the X down there. That one is a font mapping error. Would you rather be Paul or Peter? Let me let you think about it for a little while and then I would like us to have a short discussion with people around us uh, and we'll learn a bit more about each other's thinking and perhaps a bit about each other. As you tell the persons around you, would you rather be Jeremiah or Hosea? Or if the Old Testament prophets don't seem so familiar to us, maybe the New Testament apostles, would you rather be Paul or Peter? Once you thought about it, let me let you begin your sharing and I'm going to come around and eavesdrop a little bit. And then we'll do some interviews in a short while. I've got a lot of young men around here. Yes. Ah, uh, no, Paul was the apostle to the Jews. Peter, the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh. All right, I've got, a, I've got a whole bunch of young men around here. I'm going to ask among the seven of y'all, wow, that's a nice number for, for God biblically, uh, one of y'all to share with us, would you rather be Jeremiah or Hosea, Peter or Paul? Okay. Come, any one of you young men. And suddenly everyone's looking forward as if I'm standing up there, but no, I'm actually standing next to you. Okay, let's do an interview. Huh? Kai Tian, would you share with us your thoughts? Uh, Peter or Paul, Jeremiah or Hosea, and why? Paul. Because God showed himself to Paul through, even though he, like, uh, he did a lot of bad things to to his people uh, he still he still saved him and used him very mightily yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Ken, Ken, everyone heard that? no need for me to repeat, right? Ken, Kerima, you're still talking about your own Peter, Paul uh. you missed it he said, Paul, because God revealed himself to him even though he was a super anti-God person and he did many bad and evil things to God's people and against God, of course so, thank you, Kai Jian. So, if you have to take a Christian name, would, would it be Paul? <laughs> I can almost imagine Paul looking like him, you know, like, oh, this scholar, you know, the, the student of Gamaliel, you know. <laughs> Alright. Okay, down here, a lot of young ladies. Let's, let's hear from you all. Um, I know these are all men, now, but maybe if there was an equivalent uh, female, who, who would you be? I'll choose Paul also because of his radical obedience after God. So that's something that I want to learn. Alright, wonderful. So we have Paul and Pauline. <laughs> yeah, Pauline is the, the, the name Pauline is the feminine of Paul, right? Okay, let's, let's move a little bit further on. I hope that this mic can do this. Over here we have some of the uncles and aunties. Okay, this is not going very far. Um, can I invite any one of you all to share... A little bit. Thanks very much, Li Wei. That's good enough. Um, who of these men might you choose to be? Men or women? Anyone? Oh, it looks like... Okay. 
Yeah, choose Peter because he's very bold. And a few times being scolded by Jesus, but still remain faithful. So that is something that I find. Yeah, you should follow him. Thanks, Uncle Jin Tech. Wow, yeah, scolded by Jesus a few times and still remains faithful. Amen. Wonderful. Okay. Um, this side, down here, a lot of, a variety of all sorts of, of us, a very diverse group of us. I'm going to ask uh, any of the aunties and up, uh, or, 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 how, how, or, or maybe our friends from Philippines. Uh, Polos, is it how they say it in Tagalog? How? Anyone? Anyone? Hello. We're going to be here for a long time, no? <laughs> oh, Chuying. Nai Nai says Chuying, Auntie Chuying will share, so okay. So shall it be? We respect our elders. You thought only young people know how to arrow, ah? this is the way it works, man. Uh, I think I will choose Paul, because he has many places I want to learn. And from his experience, he Okay. Thank you, Auntie Ching. I would like to be like Paul, she says, because Paul endured many hardships and she wants to learn from his life. And indeed, today we're going to have the opportunity together to learn from Paul. And it's so interesting. All of you are thinking in such wonderful, diverse ways that I even didn't think about. Because when I put up this list here, I wonder if you notice something that links the two guys on the left together and the two guys on the right together. There's actually something in common between Jeremiah and Paul, which is very different from Hosea and Peter. Anyone thought about that in your response? Yes, understand. I think I can relate with uh, Peter and Paul also. Because I'm outspoken, I'm outspoken like Peter. And I make many mistakes. But I somehow I learn from it the hard way. And then when I suffer like Paul, I always become very sober very uh, down uh, to my own level and I will confess my sins to the Lord and ask Him for forgiveness and uh, what we call uh, deliverance. So in a way, I am relate with both of them in their weaknesses and their strength and that's why we need to be half Peter, half Paul. Half Peter, half Paul. And indeed that's true, you know. Um, the Bible is so full of people that we are not supposed to mimic one person but we're supposed to learn from all of their lives. Um, and indeed, actually, if you think about it carefully, each of us will be able to identify with one, at least, or more of these men. Here's what I was thinking when I had to choose between Jeremiah and Hosea. Jeremiah was single, unmarried, for all of his life. Hosea was married, was asked to be married. How many of us would like that? God says, hey, please go get married. What are you waiting for? But his marriage was to a woman who was unfaithful. That's one difference there. Paul and Peter, now you catch my train of thought. Huh? Very different from yours, right? Peter was married because he had a... Yes, because he had a wife, my mom says. Yes. <laughs> Thankfully not a husband. Because he had a mother-in-law. We don't hear about his wife in, in scripture, but we hear about his mother-in-law. So, okay, because he got mother-in-law, means he must be married. And Paul, on the other hand, as far as we know it, even though some people suggest maybe he could have been or maybe not, actually the evidence in the Bible leans towards him being single, unmarried, all of his life. As I thought about it, now, even if I think about it from the context of marriage or non-marriage, I would have a hard time choosing between these four guys. Because marriage as well as non-marriage all have their respective advantages, if you like, but also challenges. And in my prayer for us in the last couple of weeks, as we continue in our journey of exploring what a family is like, the foundations of family in God's perspective especially, 
in the last couple of weeks, I have been drawn to consider and think about those whom the Bible would say are unmarried, are virgins. That's the Bible word used there. Not in marriage or are virgins or what maybe as modern day Singaporeans we would simply say single. And I'm thinking about this from a perspective of people who will be non married, not in marriage, either for a season of your life, a part of your life. How many of us here will never go through a season of our life where we are not married? Oh, that was a chim question, right? Uh, but you all got the right answer. You all have to be, we all have to be unmarried for at least some season of our life. We are never born married. But for some of us, it will not only be a season, it will also be a lifetime. A lifetime until we meet Christ again. And so even though as my thoughts were drawn towards what God is teaching us about who the Bible says are virgins or the not in marriages, I trust that what we learn today is going to be essential and relevant to all of us regardless of our life phase. And I want to start off by exploring with you very quickly what this not in marriage or this singleness is not. What it is not. The guys on the left here, Jeremiah and Paul, would be people whom could identify with those of us who are not married, in fact, never married. And you would be people who can identify with them. And I want to tell you quickly three things which not being married is not. I mean, I want to tell you three myths. First, I want to let you know clearly from Scripture and clearly without a doubt that those of us, those of you who remain unmarried, whether for a season or for life, that is not because you are sinful. That's not because you made a sin. And because of your sin, God is keeping you not in marriage. Can you say, yes, I agree. Can or not? Yes, it's true, okay? Because even people who are married are correct, exactly. And God nowhere in the Bible shows us that He curses people to remain single for life or for a season because of their sin. So get that thought out of our heads if we are unmarried, not married for a season of our life, it is not because of our sinfulness. It's not a sin that God is punishing us for. He doesn't punish His people. Second thing, very quickly, it is not because you have some kind of character flaw that makes you someone who is unmarriable or unmarriageable. Because logic tells us that even people who are married have... How many husbands will say, Amen! Yes! How many wives will say, Yes! I know my husband and my wife has character flaws. And I know, if I admit it too honestly, I have character flaws, right? It's not because of a character flaw that we are unmarried for a season or for life. In fact, the Bible shows that it's never a reason that people were single like Jeremiah or like Paul because they had a character flaw or they were odd or a bit weird. That's why they were single. No. Even married people can be odd, can have idiosyncrasies, can be flawed. And finally and thirdly, I'd like you to recognize and remember this clearly that being unmarried is not a stage uh, or a phase of life that you must get through or get over. It is unlike the idea of a child, an infant, a toddler, a child who has to grow up, become a youth, become a young adult, become an adult, become a senior, etc. That's a phase of life linked to age. But singleness, being not married, being not in a marriage commitment, arrangement, is not a phase that you need to get through. It's not as if those who get married have all oh, passed the next level, level up. Because singleness or marriage is not directly linked to your maturity or to your age, the Bible clearly shows us that among the God-fearing, some were never married. Some were married 
and some were again not married. They were not married because they were separated by death. So singleness or unmarriage is not a required phase of life that you must get through. If you don't, something is wrong with us. No, it's not. Would you and I say that something was wrong with Jeremiah or with Paul? Because they had sin, they had character flaw, or they got stuck somewhere in their life, that's why they were unmarried? No. But instead, we are told that whether for a season or for life, all of us in our different life stations, if you like, or different life places, the Bible uses the word place in life, All of us are a permanent part of God's design community, God's design body and family, and we are equally valuable, equally significant, and equally essential. Let me say this again. It's so important that we get our understanding right that all of us in our various places in life, including those of us, those of you who will be single, unmarried, not in marriage for a season or for all of our lives, we are a part of God's design for community. We are equally valuable. You are equally significant. You are necessarily essential. Romans 12.5 says, In Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to the others. Each member. Do you understand why now we still practice church membership? While a club outside might take money from you and give you a membership for privileges, God's design for us is that born into Christ, born into His family, we all become a part of His body, a member. We are counted as part of Him. Essential, significant, and valuable. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Those of us who are married, can you say with me, yes, God has arranged me where he wants me to be. Yes? Yes. Those of us who are not yet married, but you can see marriage on the horizon. Can you say and agree with me, according to the word of God, God has arranged you to be where you are. Yes. Yes. And those of us, those of you who are not yet in marriage and do not know what it will look like in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, can you also say, I am where God wants me to be. God has placed me here where he wants me to be. Can? Yes. And we are told that every part of the body, Corinthians 12, verse 25, must have equal concern for each other. Now you are the body of Christ, we are the body of Christ, and each one of us is a part of it. Wherever we are in our life stage for a season or for life, We are part of God's intended design for community. There is no citizen and PR difference here or citizen PR foreigner difference here in the family of God. There is no first, second, third tier citizen even. We are all equally essential, equally important, equally significant in this body. And so, my desire for us is that we all need to embrace to embrace the place we are at in our life that God has put us in and also to embrace each other's places in God's design for community. Can I say that once again? To embrace our own place that God has put us 
in our lives. And then also to embrace, to accept each other's places that God has also put for all of us in His community. What this means is that married or not, with children or not, widowed or not, whatever the description is, none of us should feel out of place. We should feel and we should work that each other will feel in place in God's community, God's body, God's family. I know this is a high ideal to aim for. Just this week, I was reminded again, and last week, twice, reminded that this family, this spiritual family, sometimes doesn't seem like a family. I hear it, I accept it, because we are all fallen, we are all still broken, even though saved by grace, still sinners with a sinful default nature. It's hard to be family. But that's the way that God intends for us to be. But as I think and I pray for those of you who at this season or for potentially life, a longer season, may remain not in marriage, as I pray, as I reflect and I think about you, I acknowledge that sometimes it seems easy or easier for the married to say, yeah, we are part of a family. Because I know that in marriage, there are three aspects that are more readily, more easily fulfilled by our life partner, by our spouse. And that is companionship, sex, and children. These three aspects, they may be more, are much more easily, readily fulfilled if you are married compared to if we are, as the Bible would say, not in marriage, a virgin. And I want to say it again clearly, today we are in the mode of destroying wrong ideas, myths, huh? and declaring the truth of God. I want to say clearly, all these are biblical, spiritual desires. Let me say that once again. All of these three are biblical, spiritual, good desires. The longing for companionship, the desire for intimacy even in a physical way in sex, and the desire for offspring, generations to follow, are all biblical and God-given and spiritual desires. And it is therefore why sometimes as a non-married person, we feel the pressure or we feel like we are not in place because it is harder, or so we think, or so people will have us believe to have companionship, to fulfill our desires for sex and also our longing for children. But these three are too big, too many, too much, too big an area to cover all today. I just want to explore one area with us today and we'll keep two for next week. And I'd like to start off, as God leads me, I'd like us to explore together how companionship looks like for a not-in-marriage person, whether for a season or for life. And we will learn this through Paul. Not by his teachings, because we have explored that many times and many of us are familiar with that, but actually by his real life. Paul came to know Christ, what Kaizen was saying. He turned his life totally around, God turned Paul's life totally around in his late 20s. And after that, he was faithful to God and the last, at least we know, to the best of our knowledge, he lived till about 70. And so he was a not in marriage, he was an unmarried, he was a single man for all of his life, for much of his life even as a believer in God. And so I turn to scripture 
And if you know how Paul is revealed in Scripture, he's revealed right from Acts all the way through the letters to Philemon. There's a lot to study and to read. But I ask God, show us some places we can learn. And God, let me to Romans 16, which I'd like us to explore together today. Let's turn in our Bible to Romans 16. And from here we will learn. How does a single, unmarried, for a season or for life, man or woman, grow in companionship, even much more so than those who may be married? Romans 16, if you are there already, you will recognize immediately, wait, this is at the end of Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome. In fact, there's no teaching here or maybe just one or two sentences. In fact, it looks like the conclusion, a personal greeting, and you would be right to say that. From verse 3 to 16, you see a whole list of people whom Paul greets because they have been part of his life. And thanks be to God, by His Spirit's inspiration to Paul, he writes like this, by His Spirit's, same Spirit's inspiration and revelation to us, we learn from this. I'd like you to see that in this list, there are four groups of companions that Paul has, that every one of us should learn to have. And before we go into the details, I'd like you to notice as you scan through, perhaps you see already that This list includes people of all ages, of all races or ethnicities, they are Jews and they are Gentiles, people from all sorts of localities and nationalities, people from all sorts of backgrounds. There are slaves in this list and there are ministers, city director of public works in this list. Paul was single, but he was not solitary. He was unmarried, but he was not lonely. The first group of people that I'd like you to notice and see is actually just two people. Verse 3 and 4 tells us that there was a couple, a married couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. Now Paul calls them my co-workers or my fellow workers. If we look back at who they are in Acts chapter 18 and 19, you'll find that they were a married couple, most likely without children, and they were business people. And they were in the same business that Paul was in, tent making. They actually made tents. They made shelters. And Acts chapter 18 verse 3 tells us that Paul stayed with them and worked with them for at least two years. Paul stayed in their house and worked in their business together for two years when he was in Corinth. Later, we'll find out, verse 18 and 19 of Acts chapter 18 tells us that this trio, these three of them, traveled together and they moved together. Aquila and Priscilla moved together with Paul to Syria. Yes, the Middle East. And then after that to Ephesus. And then they were separate for about two more years as Paul went on to more missionary work. And then after that two years, they were together again for another two years in Ephesus. And Romans 16.4 here tells us they risked their lives for Paul. Acts 19 will tell us this probably happened in the city of Ephesus where there was a huge riot and Paul was in danger of losing his life. This married couple, possibly, quite likely without children, who had already stayed with, worked with and journeyed with Paul for over four years, now on their fifth and sixth year, they will risk their life to save his life. That's the kind of people that Paul had around him. But that's not all. If you look further down, you straight away see there's another list of people. Verse 5 tells us, I want you, Paul says, to greet my dear friend or the one I love, 
Eponetus. And this phrase, dear friend, is used in verse 8 for this person called Ampliatus, in verse 9 for the person called Stachys, and in verse 12 for this person called Persis. Four people whom Paul calls dear friends. The Greek word there is agapetos. And immediately you recognize, wait, 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 I heard that phrase before. You detected the word agape. Love not merely as acquaintances, love not merely between friends, love not merely within family, but the same word that God would describe His love to us. Paul says, I shared that kind of depth of love with at least these four people and there could be very many more. Verse 14 to 15 gives us a whole list of people, individual names, and we don't know too much about them. But at least for four, we are told that they were dearly loved by Paul, and they dearly loved Paul. I don't know if they were single, unmarried like Paul. Maybe because their names are mentioned as individuals. Maybe, don't know. I don't know for sure if they were similar in age, but very possibly so because the first guy mentioned, Eponetus, was the first convert in Asia. And that was probably when Paul was in his early 30s. And by the time he gets through to that whole list, look at verse 12. This person persists. And I'd like you to notice, of the four people mentioned, there are three guys and persists is listed here as a woman whom he dearly loves. Persis is one whom he says has worked very hard in the Lord. Very possibly that's proven over time. Paul was still serving God faithfully when he wrote the letter to the Roman Christians. He was already in his 50s. So perhaps through his 30s, 40s and 50s, he had people like Eponetus, Ampliatus, Stachys, Persis and many others who were dear friends. What really struck me was it wasn't just the brotherhood. It was also a close, dear relationship with a woman that Paul had. So it's possible, therefore God is telling us in his word, it's possible for us men and women who are unmarried, who are not in marriage, to have close relationships not only with people of the same gender, but also with people of the opposite gender. Ah, this is good news to me and also awakening to me because as he would later write in 1 Timothy and 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, Oh, I treat these women who are dear to me in my life as if they were my own blood sisters. I treat them with honour, with holiness. I never wrong or take advantage of them. But in absolute purity, I love them. Wow! So it's possible, maybe in modern day, modern day terms, we say platonic relationship. Yes, according to scripture, It is possible to not have a romance between a man and a woman, but still have deep admiration, enjoyment of each other's company and friendship, and truly care for one another. Isn't that refreshing for those of us, those of you who will be unmarried, not in marriage for a season or for a longer part of your life? Isn't that refreshing? Dear friends, both of the same gender, brothers, and then of the opposite gender, Sisters, and vice versa if you were female. And after mentioning sisters, then Paul talks about more people. Verse 13, he tells us about a friend called Rufus, but he points out Rufus' mother. And I'd like you to see what he says. Rufus' mother has been a mother to me too. There's a word missing in this sentence. I thought at first reading, Paul was saying, Rufus' mother has been like a mother to me too. But there's no word like there. Paul simply says, Rufus' mother was a mother to me too. The word too tells me, just like Rufus, 
her own flesh and blood, Rufus' mother took him in as her own son. And I don't want us to get different ideas of mothering than Paul has for us. He defines for us what he meant by mothering in 1 Thessalonians 2. Let me just read this to you. He says, I know what mothering is. It's about caring for little children. Wow! Paul in his 50s, when he writes this, he's thanking an older woman, older woman, Rufus' mother, for taking care of him as if he was a little child. How gentle, how we love you so much, he says in verse 7 to 9 of 1 Thessalonians 2, that we delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our lives. He says this of people who are mothers. They pour out not only their love and their care in the spiritual way, but also share their own lives. And they become so dear to us. Later, he will talk about toil and hardship and working night and day for children. But at this point, he's satisfied and glad to say, I have a mother who is not my own mother. Now, I need you to know that Paul did not come from a dysfunctional family in that sense. There's no mention of that in Scripture. It's quite possible that he had to sacrifice a lot. That may include his family. But we're told in Acts chapter 23 that he had a sister who had a son, so he had a nephew, sister and son, who was in good terms with him, so much so that the nephew comes to warn him of the plot against him. So he's close to his own family, and yet as a not-in-marriage man through his 30s to 50s, he finds not only other married couples who would risk their lives for him, dear friends who would journey with him, but also people who would mother him as if they were his own flesh and blood. But to Paul, it's not just about a couple. It's not just about brothers and sisters. It's not just about mothers or fathers. In verse 12, we see he introduces us to even more people, Tryphena and Tryphosa. This sounds like sisters, most likely so. But even if not so sure about that, never mind. Verse 15, Nereus and his sister... And then in verse 10 and 11, the whole household, the whole family of Aristobulus and Narcissus. Wow! Paul is knowing not just some people, he knows full, whole families. He's integrated, he's involved. He's in, not just with one or two people, but their families. I wish we could grow in that way too. That I would not know only you as an individual, but I would know you and your siblings and your parents and maybe your children and etc. etc. We have a long way to go, church, if we want to say we have achieved family found. But we're not at zero, thankfully. But we have a long way to go. I'd like you to notice all of these people from all ages, all races, all places, all backgrounds, they are far more than just ministry workers with Paul. Did you notice? He was not just referring to them as people who were with him in church or with him in church work, in mission work. He called them dear beloved. He called them mom. He called them my family. And I think in here is the application for all of us, not just those of us who are not in marriage for a season of our life. For all of us, I find four applications here for the matter of companionship in the seasons or lifetime of our oneness, our singleness in marriage context. We are single, not solitary for a season of our life. If we learn how to build 
our band of brothers and of sisters. If you are a not in marriage person now, what you need is BSF. No, 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 not Bible study fellowship. You need brothers and sisters who are going to be your dear friends. In case you were thinking that BSF is a dating agency. But are we investing in others who are with us, can be called our brothers and our sisters, our dear friends whom we love, agapitos. It's interesting that when they use the word band of brothers, the word band actually means to bond or to bind together. Band, as in rubber band. is to hold together, to build a close relationship. That for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness or in health, did you notice? That's exactly what marriage is, right? You can have a quote-unquote marriage-type covenant with dear brothers and sisters. I treasure, I cherish you. And may it be that only death will part our friendship. Wow! Suddenly marriage doesn't seem so much grander or at a different level. It's merely a different way of saying friend. Are we building our band of brothers and sisters, the bond that we have? Do you hang out together, whether as a few of you, or maybe just four people, like Paul lists, four people, or maybe by verse 14 and 15, maybe it's like 10, maybe it's 20. Are you hanging out with people who are going to be your dear friends, your brothers and sisters for life? At this point in time, I want to give a simple application for us. If you are not married in a phase of your life where you are not married, either for a season or for life, and you want to kind of start up like a singles club amongst this family here. Like, hey, all of us who are same station in our life, let's get together. Let's do something together on this public holiday. Let's go travel together on this, um, for this uh, occasion, etc., etc. Then I say, do it, go. But don't stop there even. Life is not all about hanging around birds of the same feather. While you build up relationships with dear friends who may be similar age, may be single or so like you, whether men or women, as brothers and sisters, I hope that you will include in your life, and now this works both ways, you will include in your life as a single, not in marriage person, married couples. And vice versa, those of us who are married already, like Aquila and Priscilla, and perhaps no children yet or have young children, would we also count not in marriage individuals or groups of such singles as part of our companionship circle? Now this is an application for me as much as it is an application for you. If I remain true to the word of God and I look at Aquila and Priscilla, that means that I should, together with me and with Hannah, be welcoming you to my house to stay over with me and to work with me. Yes! But yes, you know, our home is open for you if you decide to turn a night or more. If you turn a night or two, we'll do all the household work for you. If you turn a week, then we'll ask you to help us if we can. But that's what it should be, you know. It should not just be about a singles club. It should be about couples even with singles. And if we can learn this, and just like Aquila and Priscilla, we can travel together there. Oh boy, I promise you, I will not make you my porter or Hannah's slave or babysitter. I promise you. But we can. And not only can we travel together, Perhaps we will serve God together. And should the day come that we have to give up our lives for each other, may it be true that we will not hesitate, but risk our lives and trust that God will protect us together. Dear friends, married couples, and I pray you will go further. Would you cross the generations and find as a younger person, find and allow an older uncle or auntie to be a dad or a mum to you that you may not have in your life. 
and vice versa. The opposite is true too. May we as older uncles and aunties, perhaps you have already adult children, would you seek out a younger, a solitary man or woman and adopt him or her as your own child, flesh and blood? Would you? Sure, this can happen through marriage. We say, oh, when my son gets married, I gain a daughter. Some people say you lose a son. But this doesn't need to happen only in marriage. As God's word shows us, as Paul shows us, we especially in his family, in Christ together, should learn how to adopt one another into our families as much as we are already part of his family. That's one of the wonderful things of his family church or his family center. Their desire is to live as God's family. And so true. I see that Auntie Jane has three grandchildren which is not of her own flesh and blood yet. I see that the single, not yet married brothers and sisters there have dear friends, have relationships with married couples and have mothers and fathers. This can be true even to the point when some of us will become not in marriage again. The day that our spouse passes on, will you have children, more than just your biological children, who will love you and call you mom and dad? It starts now, even as we cross the generations and build these adoptive relationships. But let's not just stop there. Let's go the whole way. Let's put all in, all our effort, all our energies, all our abilities, and let's all be in. Let's go the whole way and involve itself in families with one another as well. These family groups that we are organized, if you like to use that word, gathered in, It's just a catalyst. It's just a way, a means of trying to, according to God's word, in obedience to Him, and according to His Spirit's revelation for us, to just begin to take steps of obedience towards these wonderful outcomes that God paints for all of us. But it's not a structure that will survive. It is the relationships in our hearts for one another. That's why I say, this is not a message for the not in marriage, the virgin among us. This is a message for all of us. It works every way. That we would have whole families embracing each other's place in life and embracing our own place in life as God's design community, body and family. Do you catch what God is telling us about singleness which is not solitariness is not loneliness someone amongst us penned this poem and he reads there's a family I love whom God gave me from above they support and love me there's no place I'd rather be I never knew I could be so blessed. I love them so much and not less. It's them I want to spend my life with. Knowing them is my greatest gift. I thank God for them every day. They give me love and joy no one ever gave. Just in case you're wondering, maybe this is my way of staying anonymous and humble. No, it's not. One of you wrote this. They've become the most important people. I will always want to be with them forever. And you will be. Because God, who is our Savior, is going to keep us together for eternity. That's a good thing. I always wanted a family like this. They taught me so much, I could make a list. Wonderful. I never knew I could be so blessed. 
I love them so much and never less. They'll always be my loved ones. I'll always treasure them. Again, pardon the typo error, but maybe that's appropriate, like hugs and kisses, you know. Or like how the Korean people do it, like ah. But friends, or should I more correctly, more rightly, more biblically, more spiritually say, family in Christ, can you catch the picture that God is painting for us to live as one in Him? For every station, for every place that God has wanted us to be in, may we embrace our place in life and embrace each other's places in life that we would be truly a family found, a family foundation founded in Christ. I'd like to pray for us now. And I'd like you to join me in prayer. Perhaps you would agree to these words that I speak, or perhaps you may too be praying on your own. But may our prayer be in accordance to the will and the ways and the word of God that he has shown to us. Abba Father, in Christ we make up one body, each part belonging to all the others. And God, you have arranged us just as you want us to be, with equal concern for each other. So our prayer is that you would grow us in genuine love, Grow us in genuine concern for others, not just ourselves. Father, would you grant us willingness to move out of our comfort zones and allow others to move into ours, allow others to move into our lives too. Apa? Would you enable us to overcome the challenges of building true family? Help us go from just mere acquaintance to true family, we pray. And Lord, Holy Spirit, renew our minds to no longer be conformed to the social patterns we observe but to embrace your design and purpose for us. That all glory may go to God. By this, by our love for one another, all will know that we are your disciples and that you are for real.